longevity investment is a thing now and it's going to be the agi that can figure out how to solve how to solve aging what about using quantum computers to model you know the entire all the cells in the human body once you have the first breakthrough that the floodgates then i open. think the floodgates open right the, the, then yeah. everyone around the world is like holy shit, maybe i don't really have to die right Welcome to Lifespan News. Today, I've got the pleasure of speaking with a visionary thinker and innovator in the world of artificial intelligence and the future of human health. Dr. Ben Gertzel is the founder and CEO of SingularityNet. It's a decentralized AI platform that aims to democratize access to advanced artificial intelligence. He's also the mind behind OpenCog, which is an open source project dedicated to developing artificial general intelligence. And he was a key figure at Hanson Robotics, where he helped create the well-known AI robot, Sophia. Beyond AI, Dr. Gertzel is deeply involved in exploring how technology can enhance human longevity, contributing to initiatives like Rejuve, which aims to leverage AI and blockchain to advance life extension research. With a career that spans cognitive science, AI development, and innovative health tech, he's shaping the future in ways that are going to impact all of us. Please enjoy this conversation with Ben Gertzel. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. I saw on your LinkedIn, you have many interests, many interests besides uh, AI, including sure. uh, yeah, philosophy of mind, consciousness, um, improvisational music, which I thought was cool because... You know, we're all going to need something to do when the AGIs yeah. take over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what kind of uh, music do you make? I guess somewhere at the intersection of uh, jazz fusion, uh, progressive rock, and experimental. So I've been. We have a band now called Desdemona's Dream, where the lead vocalist is a, is a humanoid robot, Desdemona. So I've been I've been uh, playing a bunch of keyboards. Uh, Sort of sharing the lead vocals with the with, with the robot and writing songs and such. I've been experimenting a bit with AI generated music and AI generated vocals, but just sort of sort of weaving that in little by little. Because I mean, the AI AI can write whole songs now. On the other hand, well, that's interesting. To me, as an AI researcher, it's not interesting to me as a musician because I I like to write write the songs and improvise the songs. So it's more interesting right. to make the AI sort of interact with 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 with, with me and other 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 human musicians, right? And I think that that right. as you say, after after the super AI solves the problem of scarcity and solves the problem of uh, short lifespans and so forth, yeah, we need to do something and playing music with and for each other is probably one of those things that those who choose to continue in, uh, in, in, in the human form will be doing post singularity. That's right. Yeah. And you don't want the AIs like getting too carried away with uh, their hallucinations there. You're like, listen, uh, human star of the show over here. <laughs> well, the, ro the robot is the star of our band. Uh, actually, we're, we're, all, we're, all, we're all supporting the, the robot, okay. robot front woman. But I mean, the, the thing is, even if an algorithm can come up with a better hit song than, than, than people can, which I, isn't true yet, I think we'll be doing in a few years, like, it doesn't matter. That's not why most people play music, right? You just play because it's... Yeah. It's fun to play with, 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 with and, and, and for each other. And, but if you, can, if you can get some rhythm or riff out of the AI that inspires you to play back something interesting, you can feed what you played back to the AI for its own response. I mean, this is, yeah. this is fun, right? Just like yeah. going back and forth with another human musician is fun, but going back and forth with a musician from another species is, a, is also quite an interesting thing <laughs> to play with even now when the technology is quite primitive right and i mean as it as it gets as it gets more and more advanced it's going to be even more interesting i think that's interesting that you said another species uh because i i first uh learned about you through i think through a lot of people the same way through the sophia robot yeah um and um you know there was a lot going on at the time when she was making a lot of headlines about whether or not she's alive, you know, she's getting, <laughs> she's getting citizenship over here and, you know, she's having interviews and, um, well, AI isn't going to be just one thing, right? So you can have, 
AI twins of individual humans. And there's a, one of the many AI projects I'm involved with is something called Twin Protocol, where we're aiming to make a sort of digital simulacrum of a particular human. You can try to make digital characters like Sophia or Sophia's little sister, Desdemona, who sings in our band, right? I mean, and these, these digital characters, these are supposed to be human-like. And right now, of course, they're kind of impersonating humans, but I, I mean, they're supposed to be more and more human-like in their action, their, their, their perception, their, their, their thinking. And that has its value to have a non-human mind that however comes as close to humanity as, as, as we can, then we can get some real sharing back and forth between the human and robot side. But, you know, the artificial minds that are very similar to human minds, the, these occupy a very small percentage of the overall space of minds, right? So, I mean, we'll be able to create, and then these creations will be able to create even more so, you know, all, all sorts of alternative mind architectures. And there will be, it'll be a whole, you know, virtual galaxy of alien mind species, <laughs> not, not, not just one. And that, I mean, that's hard to palpably understand right now, but it's pretty clear that if we get through the next few years and manage to create artificial super intelligence, which is beneficially oriented toward people. Like if we can get through all that, I mean, yeah. then there's an amazing spectrum that, w that we can explore. So that's, that is the topic of my shiny new book, the consciousness oh. explosion co-authored oh, wow. with a uh, Gabriel Axel uh, Montez. And we try to review sort of the, the coming, singularity and intelligence explosion, both from a technical view and from a, an experiential view of like, what, 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 what will it be like to go, to go through all that? What could we do in our minds now to prepare ourselves for, 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 for all that? Right. So there's yeah. a lot of interesting stuff there. And of course, longevity, which is uh, the main theme of lifespan.io from the broader perspective, is just a little tiny piece of it, right? Like we're talking about this one, you know, bio cybernetic informational system, the human body, and can we make it last longer and longer? Whereas after singularity, there's going to be so many different kinds of, of minds and bodies, some of which can be engineered to just replace their own parts for, 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 forever anyway, right? So from, from that point of view, the post singularity view, keeping the human body going, is a very, very special sort of problem, right? How do you think your your vision of what you just described, did, did you have that vision 20 years ago or 30, I don't know, when you started in AI? Like, has it evolved? I had that version in the early 1970s when I was a young child, actually. I mean, I, I grew up reading science fiction and and then... I encountered in the early seventies in the town library in Southern New Jersey. I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old, something like that. I encountered a book called the Prometheus project by the Princeton physicist, Gerald Feinberg. And he said within decades, we're going to get superhuman AI, molecular nanotechnology and indefinite life extension. The question is, what do we use it for? Do we use it for consciousness expansion? Do we use it for rampant mindless consumerism? And how do we decide what to use it for? Is it done by a centralized decision-making elite or is it done in a, in a globally democratic way? So, I mean, I read books on this stuff in the early 70s written by serious scientists. The, the, the ideas were out there. The technology was not as mature for realizing these things and the culture as a whole was not very amenable to these ideas. Yeah, it's interesting how closely related, uh, like the advancement of a super intelligence is with. It's like in the same breath. You talk about you know longevity, escape velocity. It's like they're they're so inextricably linked. Well, I think I think that causality is more one way than the other. If you get a super intelligence or even a human level AGI with a bent towards science. I mean, this creature right. is going to be able to solve aging and death if it wants to. 
the reverse holds much less so. I mean, you could make people immortal. Certainly gives each individual more time to think and work. So it should it should accelerate progress on AGI and other things because you won't have brilliant scientists get Alzheimer's and forget what they learned. But I mean, it doesn't it doesn't accelerate AI progress that much to solve human aging. Right. Yeah, I guess. Uh, so I guess in that way, if we're going to put our resources toward something, maybe it's better to put it towards AI first. In the, and, in the big picture, yes. But I, I think it's important mm -hmm. to realize that's not the main resource allocation problem humanity faces now. The problem we face now is how much do we spend on really important things, which includes AI, life expansion, nanotechnology, and also getting food and medicine to needy kids in the developing world. How much do we spend on important things versus how much do we spend on unimportant or destructive things like, you know, blow, blowing each other up or, or making, you know, chocolatier and chocolatier flavors of chocolate and so forth, right? So, <laughs> I mean, there right now, great majority of economic resources on the planet are spent on things that are not even that much toward the toward the good of hum of humanity really they're, they're just helping some elite to get rich at the expense of of, of, of somebody else or they're they're feeding some addictive loop in, in in somebody's mind so after we solve that resource allocation problem it would come down to okay agi versus nanotech versus life extension versus giving food to hungry kids but we're we're not actually at at, 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 the, at that point yet right longevity biology Longevity genomics is one of the key use cases that I'm using in developing my AI system, OpenCog Hyperon. So we're we're developing what I hope will be the world's first AGI, at least it's, it's my attempt to get there. But in developing a system like that, even if ultimately it's supposed to do everything, you know, in the short run, it has to do something, right? And so one of the things that we're choosing to apply are in progress would be a GI system too, it is longevity biology. And so in, 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 in that way, you can sort of try to save two birds with one stone or whatever, whatever metaphor you want to use. Tell me a little bit more about this, because I'm curious how uh, your, your project may be similar or dissimilar from a lot of the stuff that we, you know, are becoming very accustomed to nowadays with LLMs and open AI. And, you know, uh, are you using... Well, so LLMs are a really interesting and valuable technology, but they, they basically are only able to extrapolate a little ways from their training data. They can do a bit of reasoning, which is very interesting. They can munch things together in, in somewhat novel ways. They can't take big leaps beyond what's been fed into them. And this is sometimes obscured when using them by the fact that so much has been fed into them, right? Like they've, they've got more knowledge than any one human. So they can seem very, very broad and, and, and wide, right? But, but, but actually AI music models based on LLMs and other technologies can create new songs in given genres. Like you can make a 12 bar blues song, you can make a cantata or something. On the other hand, if you train an AI music model on music up to the year 1900, it's never going to invent neoclassical metal, grindcore, not even Duke Ellington, right? I mean, if you, if you ask it to mix up West African drumming with Western classical music, it, it'll put Beethoven to a West African beat or something, right? So it can't take a big leap like humans do when they invent a new genre of, of music. And if you think about science, science at its best is about making big leaps beyond, beyond, beyond yeah. what's known, right? And the kind of original, non-obvious, iterated reasoning, which integrates logic and creativity that you need to do to do really good science. This is quite remote from what LLMs can, can, can do now. And it happens that in people, being able to answer obscure questions and solve math Olymp Olympiad problems, stuff like that is correlated with being able to do original science because it means you're a smart, smart person, right? That's a shortcoming, and we're trying to overcome that shortcoming in the OpenCog Hyperon 
project. So OpenCog is an open source AGI oriented project. It's been around a while. We're building a totally new version of it called Hyperon, mostly aimed at being able to scale up millions of times relative to what we could do with the, with the older versions of OpenCog. We are using LLMs and other deep neural networks. We're putting them together with logical reasoning engines and then with evolutionary learning systems that, that emulate evolution by natural selection to create radically new things. So we're trying to synthesize LLMs with other kinds of AI systems that are good at creativity and, and reasoning, wrap these all in an overall cognitive architecture, and then use it to do a variety of interesting things in the world, controlling robots, controlling game characters, controlling artificial scientists and, and, and mathematicians and, 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 and so forth, right? And That's cool. So let me see if I uh, sort of get this straight and, and maybe uh, frame it in the way that I've been thinking about it. And you can tell me uh, how close I am. Um, so you're using LLMs as a, as a piece of the puzzle to, to kind of help analyze and feed information to some other pieces of the puzzle that all sort of work together to create more intelligence than, than, than they could in, in their single parts. And I don't know what these other pieces are, uh, because I, I'm only really familiar with LLMs. Um, but is that, am I right so far? Yeah. Yeah. And what the other pieces are is not that hard to understand either. I, I mean, okay. I mean, I mean, I think among the other pieces, so one of them is actually an explicit logical reasoning engine. So, I mean, you, you feed it a bunch of knowledge and then you ask it a question and it tries to come up with a proof or disproof of that, of that question by, by putting the pieces of knowledge of knowledge together. And I mean, this, this sort of AI has been around since the sixties evolutionary learning, which is another piece of it. This is rooted in genetic algorithms. And again, were invented in the, in the 1970s. The idea there is if you have a, you have a problem you want to solve, make up a bunch of random solutions, see how, which ones are better, which ones are worse. Take the ones that were slightly better, tweak them a bit, combine pieces of them with, with pieces of other ones. That gives you new candidate solutions. Try those out, see how they did. Take the best ones, mutate and mix them up a bit. Take those best ones, combine them. So you, you're emulating natural selection where instead of a human genome, you have an artificial genome in the computer. And instead of trying to survive in the world, you've imposed some engineered fitness function saying what's a good genome or not, right? So these, these ideas have been around in the AI field a long time. They haven't ever been deployed at a huge scale. So what we're doing in the Hyperon project, we're trying to deploy some of these other historical AI methods at the same amazing scale that has been used with transformer neural nets and connect them with, with transformers. And we're, we're trying to fill in what are the gaps in LLMs, which I see the main ones are sustained fact grounded logical reasoning and then wild out there creativity right and and by putting in other algorithms that are good at, that are good at those things what what llms are good at is serving up knowledge if you look at longevity biology you clearly need all of these aspects right like serving up all the knowledge is very important because there's a lot of biological knowledge but you need to be able to take a big creative leap beyond the hypotheses out there and you need to do sustained fact grounded reasoning to check if your creative leaps make any sense or not. Right. So those two sort of go together. If you can make creative leaps, but not reason, you'll just spout a whole bunch of bullshit, even more than LLMs do now. Right. But if you can reason, but can't make creative leaps, you won't know what hypotheses to form to even, to even re re reason about. Right. So you, you, you you need all these pieces to make something like a really human-like, generally intelligent mind. Is there is there any way to imbue these systems with like a way to to want something? Because right now, like let's say with ChatGPT, you know, if I'm if I don't ask it anything, it's it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there, you know, silent. So I I have to I have to get the ball rolling. There was a paper by the. AI researcher and mathematician and cognitive architect Stan Franklin some decades ago. And the title was 
is it an agent or is it just a program, right? And right. what he was pointing out is most AI programs then were just programs designed to take an input and produce an output, right? Whereas an agent embodied in the world has some goals it's trying to fulfill, can be some explicit, some implicit, but it's perceiving, it's acting iteratively in a world trying to fulfill some goals. And there's been a field of AI and computer science called agent systems for quite a long time. And I do think that ties in importantly with reasoning and creativity, because to do reasoning and to do creativity at the human level, you need to form abstractions. You can't just work at the level of the observed data. Things that you can throw at an animal to kill it, because we need, we need to do that. And so we get started with choosing abstractions based on which abstractions are useful to us in doing things within the limitations of our, of, of our bodies and achieving our goals. Then based on these practically derived abstractions, we build a sort of hierarchy of more and more abstract abstractions, right? And without being an agent, you could still derive a hierarchy of abstractions, but it's less clear what would drive it. You'd have to make up some sort of artificial metric for what's a good abstraction. It's not clear how to do that. So I think, I think the easiest way to get to a human level AGI is to give it some sort of embodiment in some sort of environment and give it some goals to drive at least part of it, its, its behaviors. And, but this could be a lot of different things. Like it, so it could be a robot and we're working on that in one of my projects called mind children. It like could a be, robot to, uh, have a body to help, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, there's, there's a lot of detail in the physical world that we interact with. So that could like help with every consciousness, day, which perhaps? Hel it helps. I mean, if you just look at linguistic semantics, like the complexity of a word like on or over or to is, is quite subtle. Like in English, why do we get on the bus, but, but, but in the car and, you know, you can, you can, you can get over a physical obstacle or you can get over a broken relationship or you can, you can get over a limitation in, 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 in thinking you can be in the pool if your head is sticking out of the pool, but if your foot is dipping in the pool, it's not clear if you're in the pool, right? So, so I, I mean, our, our, our language, our language itself embodies a lot of subtly from our physical engagement in the world. And this right. drives a lot of our creative and, and rational thinking. It's not to say that you have to have a robotic body to be human like general intelligence. I don't think you do, but I think it's a, it's a quite convenient way we we'll experiment first. with AGI, AGI algorithms, but, but not the only thing. I mean, you can do a lot with video game characters, but you could also do a lot with an agent whose goal is to make scientific progress, like cure human aging or something, right? I mean, that, <clears throat> that, that, that's, that's also a goal to create therapies that will prolong the lives of, 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 of organisms, right? So there, there yeah. can be different AI agents which have different goals that will then cause their minds to be sculpted in different ways. But in, in, indeed, chat GPT is not really an agent in, the, in that sense. It could have been architected that way. But, you but think you're the ones open you're AI chose it. not to architect it that way, right? Right. Or is that, uh, so is that more the direction that you're going in with, uh, with your companies? Is yeah, 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 agents? certainly. So I have, <clears throat> there's a cognitive architecture called premise, which I developed over many decades, which explains how to combine different types of learning, reasoning, and memory to make an AI agent that can achieve complex goals in, in, in complex environments. And of course, you can make an agent whose goal is to amuse people with funny conversations or to answer their questions. So it's not like you couldn't make a chatbot with a more agent-oriented architecture, but you can't just wrap that around a chatbot. And <clears throat> right after <coughs> ChatGPT was launched, you saw a bunch of attempts like <coughs> baby AGI or auto GPT or something. And <clears throat> yeah, I think they, they end up straying largely from the, from the original goal. They didn't work because being an agent has to be incorporated 
in the whole cognitive architecture of the system. You can't just make a chatbot and chatbot and wrap like agentness or, 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 or around it like that, which is obvious to everyone in the cognitive science field. But of course, I can't blame random hackers from trying try, 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 trying to create these things, right? So is Hypercog involved in any way with, uh, I know, because you have so many companies, uh, with Rejuve.ai? Uh, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. So to, to review the sort of architecture of my would-be AGI business empire, I mean, we <laughs> there's an open source AGI project called OpenCog, and Hyperon is the new product from OpenCog. And that's just an open source software product, sort of like Linux is. It, it, it's not a company, okay. right? Then Got it. Yeah. We have a project called Singularity Net, which is a foundation that issues a utility token, which is now the, the ASI token for artificial superintelligence, right? And so so we, ha we have Singularity Net, which we did a token sale for in 2017. And that has built a blockchain based platform that lets you run AI systems on large networks with no central owner or controller. So that's sort of at the infrastructure level, like OpenCog Hyperon is one of the many things you could run on top of the singularity net blockchain based decentralized architecture. Interesting. How, how does the, how do people get access or, or is, do they have to pay? Is it pay per use pay, pay with the coin? Like, well, Singularity Net is all open source code. Anyone could put an agent online on their computer and it could then communicate with the Singularity Net network. So just like anyone could put an Ethereum or Bitcoin node on, on, on their on their on their computer, but I mean then they have to pay to run that run that run that hardware node, right? Blockchain is going to be in the advancement of research for longevity. Really depends on what kind of data we end up needing for making what are the most relevant breakthroughs, which which we don't know right now. This blockchain hopefully help keep our data secure because I'm thinking about this EEG data that's coming from the neural links that are being impl uh, implanted in some of these uh, early people. So, you know, you don't want your, <laughs> your brain data. <laughs> when you build your network on a blockchain platform, like every network transaction is, 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 is secured. So you're, you're pursuing security by 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 design rather than patching it on at the end. So yeah, ju just as just as you can't patch an agent interface on ChatGPT and have it be an agent, you can't really take an insecure software system, put a firewall and antivirus on it and have it be secure, right? You really want to be doing security by design through the whole system, and blockchain networks are are one way of doing that. Yeah, it'd be pretty important, especially with brain data. You'd want to, if you're if you're sending that up to the cloud, you're gonna <laughs> not want it to be tracked or used to, uh, I don't know, manipulate you somehow. Well, what's happened now is people put their data into Twenty Three and Me, and they yeah, sold it to GlaxoSmithKline. I, I mean, yeah. in the end, GSK. I, mean, I guess it's supposed to help uh, advance science. That's that's why well, I, I mean, decided I mean, no, no, to do no, it. No question. And they're probably <clears throat> probably not <coughs> selling that data to too many intelligence agencies, although <laughs> although, although who knows, right? I mean, yeah, and yeah, they're doing research. It's a trade-off. The hey, they can help me live forever. The issue is more that only they are doing worth research, it, I guess. right? Uh, I mean, why not aggregate that data, scramble it using homomorphic encryption, so that people can't be identified, and then open it up for any any researcher to use, right? Like what what, what why should only that one big company get 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 used to that data? It's not that GSK can't do something helpful. It's that they should be able to pursue it along with everybody else in in, in trying to discover something something helpful, right? What about using quantum computers to model, you know, the entire all the cells in the human body? I think that's possible. Yes, but I don't think that eventually, I guess, solves the same problem. You can, I think you can make far better systems biology simulation models than we have now on classical computers, first of all. So not much attention has gone into systems biology. So you could, you could make a whole organism simulation 
of these simulation models, you still need a lot of data. And then you're back to the same issue. Either you are okay. a pharma company or a consortium thereof, or you're getting that data in, in more, more of a crowdsourced way, right? And right, not, okay. not that a blockchain network is the only way to gather crowdsourced data. I mean, you could, you could do it in a lot of other ways. That just is a way of incentivizing people to, to contribute data to a data commons. It doesn't require a large initial bankroll, but I mean, you can, you, you, you can, you can do it in other sorts of ways. It's just very hard to get around gatekeepers like UK biobank, for example, is a very interesting resource, but as an American working in a crypto project or a startup company, I have no straightforward way to get my hands on the UK biobank data. Hmm. Even if the individual British people who contributed there might like me to, right? So, I mean, just mm. not all ways of sort of crowdsourcing data, even if they're not commercial, end up being tremendously open, right? So it's, and you okay. face that problem for simulation modeling as well as for, for analytics, because you need a lot of data to, to tweak, to tweak the simula simulations. Well, hey, uh, we don't have too much time left, but I so I wanted to get your uh, your thoughts on what you think is the most exciting new technology or the most likely, let's say, to uh, make the biggest longevity impact that that sort of exists today or, or is coming soon. Oh, I I wouldn't say I know the answer to that, and I, I'm I'm open to being very surprised. But one thing I would say. From looking at the data from Rejuve Biotech's long-lived flies that Candy and her team have been gathering. So a fly has about 14,000 genes, 2,000 plus substantially differ in the long-lived flies from the control flies. But we've done a bunch of work to try to find a smaller set of genes, like say a few dozen genes, which carry a lot of causal impact in, in making the long lived flies live a long time. Now, then how do you target a few dozen genes, right? But may, maybe there's some sort of molecular think, biology tricks that can be used to, yeah. to get it, get us there sooner by hacking, hacking viruses to transport things or, or something. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's one direction think, that very clearly comes out of my own work because with machine learning, we can identify sets of genes where it's pretty clear if you could vary them in vivo in a, in a tissue in a coordinated way, you could restore that tissue to a state of youth. But, but then, but then, and we can show that in flies in many cases, but then how do you actually, how do you actually do that? We, 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 we don't have a way, but see, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a biologist and this delivery mechanism stuff is all about, the wet part, right? What, 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 I, <laughs> yeah. what I can do most easily now is figure out what you need to tweak in the genome or the proteome or the metabolome or the epigenome. What do you need to tweak to make an organism live a long time? And of course, if an AGI that was twice as smart as me understood molecular biology and lab equipment, it may well figure out delivery vectors you know, for a hundred genome variations at, at, at one time like that. Right? Well, when is that going to happen? Let's get your prediction on, on well, that. <laughs> we don't know when that will happen. I mean, my buddy Ray Kurzweil, who has a nice new book out as well, by the way, The Singularity oh, is pick that up. Yeah, right? I've got to get it. So, yeah, yeah Ray, has, Ray has hypothesized 2029 for the breakthrough to human level AGI. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make it happen sooner, but, uh, I mean, if it's not till 2029, I hope we can, we can both live that long. And I think that after you get to human level AGI, I think it'll only be a few years till you start seeing AIs that are dramatically superhuman in, 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 in many ways. In other words, I think Ray's 2029 date for human level AGI is not bad, could be off by a couple of years, plus or minus. I think his date 2045 for the singularity is too pessimistic because I think after you get 
a human level AGI. It'll only take a few years for that human level AGI to build a smarter one and a smarter one and a smarter right. one and get on to the singularity. So somewhere in there between the human level AGI and a vastly super human, human super intelligence, somewhere in there is going to be the AGI that can figure out how to solve, how to solve aging. As soon as we get an AI that's as smart as a human, it's instantly going to be way superhuman because it's going to be, it can think at a zillion times faster than us, right? So as soon as it's as smart as our, our co us cognitively, won't it be, be a thousand times faster? Well, having the individual processors faster, having the individual processors faster doesn't necessarily make it smarter. It depends what it's doing with those processors. But I think a more relevant point is once you have one human level AGI, I mean, modulo money to build hardware, you can then have a thousand or 10,000 human level AGIs. And they will be able to link their minds together in ways that humans can't do because, because they're all architected on the same. Until we have Neuralink. <laughs> yeah, but that's, <laughs> it won't be the that's same. That's going to be hard just because yeah. again, you can slap a link on there and it will be really, really interesting, but our brains are just not architected for linking together. Right. And, and we can't easily re-architect them to be better at linking together without giving up a lot of our basic, identity and, and humanity, whereas an AGI can morph itself for more optimal linking together with other AGIs in a very flexible way, because its mind is all in, in software. And th this indicates one of the many choices we'll face after a singularity, which is like, how human do we want to remain versus how many new capabilities do we want to onboard, even if they bring us far beyond, you know, what we would now think of as, as being human. And I hope a broad spectrum of choices in this regard are made by different people. Like I would, I would love to see some traditional humans remain, True. maybe get, get, get rid of death and disease and mental illness and, and whatnot. Is this part of the explosion in your book? Like I've been talking about the human biological Cambrian explosion for a long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a proliferation of different species of, consciousness right okay and, yeah i mean improved humans will be part of it engineered agi minds will be another part of it but then yeah rapidly uplifted and repeatedly self-improved minds will be another it's part be a wild of it. world it's yeah it should be quite interesting world. do you think because uh because having a healthy population and a long-lived population uh, increases a country's GDP. Do you think it won't, won't it become like an arms race to make a country there, a country will want their citizens to live long and to make their themselves rich? I don't think so. No, no. Well, how will we pay social security for all of these so many more old people? Right. So uh, well, they'll I mean, be able I mean, to work, I, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's clear to you. It's clear to you and me. Yeah. On the other end, if AI is taking all the jobs, maybe you're just making more mouths to feed with universal basic income, right? So, well, I mean, or maybe I mean, we'll, we'll all be playing music, uh, smooth jazz, yeah, with our robot I mean, friends. I, to, me, <laughs> to me, it's very clear that human life is good, dying is unpleasant, and we should abolish the plague of involuntary death just for basic ethical reasons. Well, this is my soapbox. I'm trying to get the word out there. This should be an arms race and it's good for the economies. You know, this is, this is my message. Yeah. On the other hand, it shouldn't be an arms race because we should have international cooperation on this rather, rather, rather than, than silos compete, competing with each other, which is how our arms race True. is. Even though like it's, it's amazing the world is waking up that people living a long time is both plausible and, and is a good thing. And it's great that longevity investment is a thing now and there, there are VCs focused on it. It's, it's not a, considered a joke anymore. Yeah. We're trying to get that message out. We're trying to stoke, uh, uh, enthusiasm for this type of research and funding. What do you think are any, do you have any advice for organizations like us to, to help, uh, speed this process? Investors want an exit. If you're talking about regular business investors rather than, than donors or government agencies, anyway, investors want an exit. 
the likely exit for a medical therapy startup is selling to big pharma. So then suddenly everything becomes about the limited mindset of big pharma and how can you make something that, that, that will that will appeal to them, which is just an an, an annoying way to ha- to have to think, right? So I, I mean I mean I think uh, we need to be getting early stage startups in longevity therapeutics far enough along that they get through like early stage human trials of therapies so that then pharma will have to partner with them even if they're doing something weird that's out, 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 outside the normal mental scope. Because, I mean, pharma guys will ultimately look at data if it's close enough to the money, right? But yet you have to get further and further through the, hmm. through the pipeline. You also have to be willing to invest early, earlier in the pipeline. Like most longevity VCs, only want to invest in something where you have a specific therapy that's already already in testing, but and then what they say, well, leave it to the NIH to fund things at an earlier stage. But NIH is very very conservative, also. So I mean, now there's not really anyone who wants to fund the earlier stages of, of longevity research. I mean, Sense Foundation is, and and uh, the, 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 there there there's some niche organizations doing it. I mean, Singularity Net is helping out with, 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 with Rejuve, but we, we, we don't have any adventurous minded, open minded organization that's willing to fund early stage research toward the discovery of longevity therapeutics. In, instead, you have VCs who are willing to jump in once you get to the stage of having a therapy that's already being tested and then mostly only if it's the kind of therapy that pharma clearly will want to will want will want to acquire and then at the level of even government research funding you still have a very blinkered view of things like you don't have a focus on systems biology and whole, whole systems thinking but clearly longevity is a whole systems problem it's not just about like find one pathway and, 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 and poke it, poke it to have an effect. Right. So there, there, there's a lot of issues and yeah, I mean, education, which in a way is a lot of what you guys, you, you guys are doing is, yeah. is, yeah. is, is, is super important and very hard because no one in the modern era has any time to pay any attention to, to, yeah, that's right. I'll try to make it fun. like a fundamentally yeah. new way of thinking. People want to absorb, Factoids. They, they, they don't. They don't want to absorb a new paradigm. But yet, people kind of, <clears throat> kind of <clears throat> need a paradigm shift in the way that they're thinking about lo- lo- longe- longevity, and it's it's challenging yeah. to affect that. That's why I'm I'm sort of a fan of what uh, Brian Johnson is doing with his uh, competition for people to um, you know compare all their data. And stuff. I think that's uh, that's fun, and it gets people excited. You need you need it you need it not to be creepy looking rich white <laughs> yeah. guys from Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, I mean, I I I, I, I love Brian. I, yeah. I knew him in DC. I knew him in DC right when he was catching out Braintree. But I mean, yeah, you you need stuff like that, but you need it to be somehow broader based and with a more inclusive inclusive feel to it right well ben i i don't want to uh go too long i know we've already gone over time so um i want to just thanks for talking with me and uh, giving me all this information yeah 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 well thanks thanks for the interesting questions and it's it's good to talk to someone willing to follow the whole thread from AGI to super longevity to business structure and, and, and culture and so forth. Cause really all, all these things are, are, are of a, of a piece, right. And, and we need to think about them in a coherent, uh, coordinated way. And who knows, we may see in the next few years, a tremendous breakthrough, either just from a bio lab or from, from, you know, Reju bio using, using our, our AI technology. And I do think once you have the first, breakthrough where the mainstream medical establishment acknowledges like take this therapy your life will likely extend by five years and 
we now expect the maximum lifespan of the species may not be 123 anymore. Maybe it's 140, right? Like yeah. once you have the first breakthrough that, that gets to that level, the floodgates then I open. think the floodgates open, right? The, the, then yeah. everyone around the world is like, holy shit, maybe I don't really have to die, right? That's like <laughs> a chat GPT moment for longevity, yeah. but, 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 um, but more so. So I think we'll probably be at that moment within the next 10 years. I'm hoping it's within the next three, three to five years, right? But, but yeah. I, 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 after that, what we're seeing now will still seem like the, the end of the prehistoric era. Huh? Yeah. Well, that's exciting. That's exciting stuff. And I'm excited to read your book. It sounds like there's a bunch of uh, good visualizations for this crazy future that you can't really see beyond the singularity, but it sounds like you're trying to uh, figure it out. We try to see beyond the singularity. We also try a lot to understand how to optimize the path toward the singularity in, in, okay. in, 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 in terms of uh, what should we be doing now scientifically culturally and in our own minds to sort of sort of work, work toward work toward a better and better singularity yes yeah, so g give it give it a read we got the the consciousness explosion right here lots lots, lots of pretty pictures too so, yeah. <laughs> nice yeah thanks yeah, a lot i'm gonna pick that up great thank you so much appreciate it Bye-bye. To stay up to date on cutting edge longevity news, definitely go check out lifespan.io. Also consider subscribing, liking, sharing this with somebody that you think would like it. And that's it for us. Thanks for watching Lifespan News. I'm Emmett Short. See you in the next one.